else is histories and mysteries i'm ashley and i'm jessica and on this week's episode ashley is going to be talking about a really awful story yeah it's not great (laughs) yeah it's uh she's gonna be talking about the aaron caffey case yep and i am going to have a more lighthearted historical story on the matchstick girls oh very cool i learned about them when i watched enola holmes same and that's that's uh, as soon as i watched enola holmes like the second one and then at the very end where they were like showing the news articles i'm like oh i'm gonna put that in my phone yeah i was like oh that's actually real how cool (laughs) and for those of you that usually watch on youtube um (laughs) my video is down today because i live in rural canada and my internet sucks so (laughs) (laughs) it is just enough to get me by on audio (laughs) not video yes so we will only be releasing audio for this one but you know you can see our pretty faces next week (laughs) <laughs> yes awesome um <laughs> awkward silence that was really awkward <laughs> awesome oh my god okay. guess what I did last night Jessica I know what you did but what did you do actually <laughs> I went and saw Wicked oh, it was How so was good it? Yeah. oh my god it was so good we um we went to the traveling show in DC uh, at the Kennedy Center. And at first, we went to this restaurant called Inca Social, and it's Peruvian food. Yum. And I got this ceviche that I will dream about for years. It was amazing. <laughs> oh, nice. It was so good. Oh, and then, yeah, and then we went and saw Wicked, and it was, oh, God, it's so good. I mean, just like the raw talent that these people have. I it's know. insane. And insane. It's wild. I think we both saw it on Broadway too, right? Yeah. Yeah. That was where I first saw it. Yeah. Was it just as good? Yes. It really was. And the girl who played um, Alphaba, she also, I was looking her up. Apparently she also played Jasmine in the touring Aladdin. Oh, cool. Yeah. So she was amazing. And the lady who played Glinda was amazing. And the guy who played... um. Uh, fig- for fear fear no. fear Fiero. Fiero. thank you yeah. was amazing <laughs> just in the song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the i can't even get like the ensemble was oh, really? so good oh it was just I, oh, so good when kyle and my i think it was our first night in new york city and we went to wicked on broadway oh. and as soon as they like the opening music started i just started crying oh <laughs> it was so happy so... I had, like i wanted to see it so long yeah and i finally got to see it and it was just incredible yeah and so... then the fact that i got to share it with kyle was just also wonderful Aww. So. well i went with cody because it was my christmas present and he doesn't like musicals <laughs> no he doesn't he's not a theater person he's not a musical person um and it, he says now that he liked it he said it was cute it was a good story Aww. but at the time <laughs> he thought that when intermission happened he thought it was over and that like something Aww. that happened and they just forgot about intermission and then that was the <laughs> end of it <laughs> i was like oh no there's a whole nother half <laughs> oh my gosh it's like hockey <laughs> an intermission and then they keep playing yeah honestly i never understood i'm so sorry this is like a weird sidetrack but like (laughs) in hockey the first period happens and then you have the intermission right Mm -hmm. it never made sense to me why it would be after only one period like to me it would be better if you had an intermission after the second period yeah that would make more sense right yeah yeah because 
like I would rather sit longer at the beginning than at the end. Yeah. Yeah. I think I agree with that. I had to think yeah. about it, but I think I agree about <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And I just never, ever understood it. I thought it was the most stupid thing ever. Yeah. That is weird. I didn't really watch hockey though. So my husband does. <laughs> <laughs> and don't. if I want to spend quality time with him, I also you watch need hockey. to watch hockey. <laughs> <laughs> and it's on in the background. And usually when he watches hockey, I'm like researching for the podcast or ah, doing yeah. some side work and stuff for but I'm on the couch downstairs, so like we're close to each other. <laughs> yeah, we do when um Cody plays his video games, I'm usually on TikTok. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I banished Kyle upstairs yesterday so that he could watch hockey and I could play my video game. Oh, very yeah. nice. Yeah, I'm t- I'm done the main story. I'm just doing side shit now. Cody always does that too. He plays the main story and then he goes back and does side stuff. And I was like, that's so weird. You're playing the same game again. No, because the main story, like for example, the game that I'm playing. You know what? No. No. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> I just feel like we're talking way too much. <laughs> you know what? No. <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyways, let's get into our story because I'm sure people don't want to keep hearing us ramble about our, our random hangout <laughs> sessions with our husbands. Yeah, you're probably right. Um, you know, <laughs> <our> catch up. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about Aaron Caffey. So, I want to. <laughs> um, oddly enough, when you had suggested this, the story sounded really familiar to me, but I didn't really remember it because I have the memory of a goldfish. Yeah, I can attest to that. Yeah, yes. go on. <laughs> but I had watched a show on this called <clears throat> Killer Women with Pierce Morgan, which he's oh. a whole issue in himself. But I did watch the show like a year ago. Like that and, stupid British guy? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, and um, she was one of the people on it. Um, and apparently he had said that she was the most evil woman he has ever met. But Oh, my gosh. Probably, like, for, you know, TV purposes. But anyway, so I used that documentary because they did interview her. So it was interesting to see the things that she would say and how she, like, reasoned through things. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I used All That's Interesting Ooh. and Thought Nova. Oh, okay. <clears throat> In March of 2008, fire rescue arrived on the scene of a house fire. They were able to put out the fire, but were shocked when they found the bodies of a woman and two young boys. They had been shot and stabbed, and therefore, fire was mm. not their cause of death. It was mm-hmm. you to try and hide what had taken place that night. How? Like, like were the were the perpetrators thinking that the bodies would be charred before? I think so. Which Cruz got there as one of my favorite podcasts that I listen to called True Crime Obsessed says, "Stay stupid, criminals." <laughs> that doesn't work. Literally. <laughs> oh my god! Seriously. Mm. So, that um, doesn't burn. No, and. As you'll find out, they're young, so they're dumb. But (laughs) thankfully, there was one survivor who was able to make it to the neighbor's house and call the police. This survivor was Father. (laughs) Father Abraham. (laughs) (laughs) This survivor was the father of three, Terry Caffey, and he knew exactly who had killed his family. Okay, side note. Who names their child Terry Kathy? No, his name is Terry Kathy. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that would make sense. Considering the story's on Aaron Kathy. <laughs> yes. So Terry said that around 2 a.m., three people burst into him and his wife's room and started to open fire. Terry was first shot five times 
And then they shot his wife, Penny, and returned to shoot Terry several more times. In Whoa. total, he was shot 11 times. Holy shit. Yeah. Holy he said God. he couldn't move the right side of his body, nor could he speak. He felt like he had been shot in the face. And he was going in and out of consciousness. But he came to just in time to watch in horror as the intruders took a samurai sword and stabbed Penny in the neck, almost decapitating her. Okay. Uh, trigger warning. This next uh, bit is pretty sad. It's about a 12 and an eight year old that die. So if you don't want to hear that fast forward about 30 seconds, they then went into the little boys rooms who were 12 and eight and <clears throat> they shot okay so i heard one where they said they shot matthew and another mm -hmm. one where they said it was tyler so one of the little boys was shot and their dad from the other room coming in and out of consciousness heard his little boy yell no charlie why are you doing this before he died oh, no. Oh, no. the intruders then oh, i'm getting chills the intruders then turned to tyler who was hiding in the closet and took turns stabbing him <gasps> until he was dead. They're just little boys. Yeah. They then lit the house on fire and fled the scene. At this point, Terry was finally able to get up without losing consciousness and was able to get to his neighbor's house for help. It took him an hour to get there. He said that he tried a couple different ways to get out of the house, but like flames would like come at him so he'd have to try another way and then you know he was shot so who knows if he lost consciousness on the way there but he finally got to the neighbor's house where they called 911 and he said <clears throat> Terry lives um and so they are they do interview him as well and he said that he wasn't really thinking rationally um because again he saw his wife pretty much get deca decapitated but at this point, he was thinking if he could just get them out and get help, everything would be okay. Oh, no, no, that's not how it works. Yeah. And then he said, um, he also said in the interview that he was thinking, if I die, nobody would know who did this. I've got to stay alive long enough so that I can identify the killers. Oh, oh that's so sad. Yeah, it's really sad. I'm like trying not to cry. It's so sad. The family had one other child, Aaron, who was 16 years old at the time, but she could not be found. Terry did identify her boyfriend, Charlie, as the killer, and Charlie was quickly arrested with two of his accomplices. As police searched their home, well, the police officer said that he found a blonde wig and he went to like move it out of the way, but realized that it was not a wig. It was Aaron. And he said in the interview, it startled us a little bit. So, well, not a little bit, a lot, you know. <laughs> so basically, that was his nice way of scaring, scared, saying it scared the shit out of him. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Aaron said that she had been drugged and kidnapped from the house. So police brought her in and started to question her. She stuck to her story of being drugged, but one of the accomplices uh, that had been arrested said that he was offered $2,000 to help, quote, take care of business by Aaron. Uh, oh my god. Drama. So oh, this next part is awful. He Sorry. well, police went to visit Terry, the dad, in the hospital to tell him what they had found out. And Terry, the first thing he asked was how his daughter was because she was the only one that wasn't in the house and nobody would tell him anything. Um, and they wouldn't let him watch the news, mm -hmm. but he had some idea that Aaron was probably involved. I'm thinking he probably heard people talking. Probably. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Or like <laughs> he knew something was off, you know, he just, he knew something. Um, or the fact that, you know, he identified her boyfriend and yeah. she wasn't around. So it's kind of. Yeah. Um, so he asked, uh, and you know, he said like, what was her involvement in this? And they said her involvement was great. And he began to sob. Like they have you, Aww. the inner, you could hear him sobbing. It was 
just this like oh it was so sad it was just this guttural sob it was oh it broke my heart i couldn't even imagine like did you you watched the uh the um like the hamilton on disney yeah 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. and you know like when eliza loses philip yeah 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 it was philip right I don't think so. I think so. I don't know. Anyway, it's like the sob that just came out of her. Yeah, it's awful. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> you. sorry. Thank you. So, Aaron denied. So, Aaron denied that it was her idea to kill the family. Um, but police were pretty sure it was her idea five months prior to this horrific night Aaron met 18 year old Charlie Wilkinson this meeting would forever change the lives of eight people but Aaron was a teenager and she was swept up in the love of it all she was 16 you know um I and Charlie was 18 so he was like you know older and you're 16 and your hormones are racing and just, it's, you know, true love to her. And they met when she was working part-time at a waitress at her local Sonic and the relationship moved really, really quickly. They remember by the time they met to the time that he committed these murders, it was only five months. And in that five months, they were already talking about marriage. She was 16 Mm -hmm. And he had given her like a promise ring and it was a ring that was his grandma's. So, you know, just being 16, this was, you know, her whole world, but her parents were not in love with Charlie. The Kathy family was a deeply religious family and Penny homeschooled all of the kids. They were heavily involved in their church. And when Aaron stopped performing in the church choir, and her grades began to slip, her parents decided to check out this Charlie character online. So they logged on to his MySpace account. Well, they logged on to <laughs> see his MySpace account. Did you have a MySpace? Or are you are you too young? Um, I think I did, but it, I was like more into just like the MSN Messenger. Okay. I definitely had a MySpace. Yeah. And then those websites that you could like code and stuff. Oh, yeah. Was it like Zanga or something? It wasn't Zanga for oh. us, but okay. it was, I'm sure it was similar. Yeah. We had um, Zanga, which was like stupid. Like, I don't know. You could make polls and stuff on it that people could vote on. But yeah. definitely out of MySpace. You know, you created your own music when people landed on your page <laughs> and you had your top eight. And that was a whole drama. And yeah, the days of MySpace and Tom. Everybody out there knows Tom, but um, they decided to check out his MySpace and um, <clears throat> he had a lot of sexual and alcohol references and being that they were so deeply religious, this was not going to fly with them. And then one night Aaron broke her phone curfew. I'm assuming it was just like time to get off the phone and go to bed or like wind down. Yeah. And that was the last straw. And they insisted that she break up with Charlie. And that month was the month that she started talking about killing her parents, according to her friends. And apparently she didn't just talk about it. She started to plan it with Charlie and his friend, Charles Wade. Prosecution believes that Aaron was the mastermind behind the plan, but she denies it. And Terry doesn't believe it. (laughs) That's good. Yeah, I kind of think he has to not believe it. I don't know how he would continue on if he believed that she was the mastermind behind this you know what i mean oh i thought you said he he did no he didn't believe that she was the mastermind oh no terry no i know um so the night of the murders according to the teens they drove up to aaron's house but the family's black lab started barking so they left aaron called charlie um and there's phone records to show this um she said like i'll take care of the dog just you know where are you come back and they did go back and picked up aaron 
And then they all drove to a cemetery where they planned out the murders for an hour. That's morbid. Yeah. When they went back to Aaron's house, Aaron and um, Charles's girlfriend, who was with them, stayed in the car. Uh, as According to Charlie, as he was leaving the car, he told Aaron that he'd have to kill her little brothers, too, so that there weren't any witnesses. And she reportedly said, I don't care. Just do what you got to do. Whoa. That's what? A, yeah. So that's when they murdered all three and then set the house on fire. And then Charlie and Aaron went back to Charlie's brother's trailer and had sex. I just. Yeah. So, I... okay. yeah. This all became a he said, she said, right? So Charlie was saying one thing and Aaron was saying another. Um, But Bobby, who was the girlfriend, she said that. um. Aaron had been saying that her mom was pushing her and slapping her and punching her. Um, and so she was saying that she was getting beat and that's why they needed to kill her parents. Um, wow. Charles said that Aaron, after all the murders said, Holy shit, this is awesome. Oh no, that's not awesome. No. <clears throat> so at first, right after all this happened, Terry was obviously pissed um the anger he felt was you know just intense and it wasn't directed at Aaron it was directed at the other three teens and the prosecutor talked to Terry and was like you know we don't even need to talk about the death penalty right now we're not at that stage yet and um Terry said to her he ate at my table i want the death penalty Whoa. and <clears throat> He said that's that he, not what I would have expected. Yeah. He said that he was so angry. He was sitting like three bleachers back from him in the court. And so you see, he could see like the back of their head. And he was like, I could just shoot them. Like I could get a gun and I could just kill them. And he actually went as far as to buy a gun and brought it in his truck to court. Oh, holy shit. And he went out to his car to get it one day and Terry. something in him stopped him. And he stopped himself and he said, you know, this is not, this is not what I need to do. This is not what I should do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, because it was such a, he said, she said court case, they did end up calling one of Aaron's other ex-boyfriends to the stand. And he said that they also broke up because her mom and dad didn't want him to see Aaron. He said that she told him that she was going to hire someone to kill her parents because she said that every time she gets a boyfriend, she really likes her mom and dad tries to break them up, which it sounds yeah, like they that's... did. But I mean, that's not a reason yeah. to kill your parents. Well, and they're clearly right because for boyfriend murdered your family. Yeah. So. Because of this testimony from her ex-boyfriend and the testimony of Charlie and the two other teenagers, um, they were ultimately all charged with three counts of capital murder and sentenced to life. The two boys who actually did the murder got life without parole, but Aaron did get eligibility for parole after 40 years. Oh, no. I feel like the masterminds should get more more i agree or the same like they did the planning yeah. they you know like yeah so this interview she had with pierce morgan was interesting um one of the things she said was when i look back on it now this is all just stupid i mean for what they weren't beating me they weren't starving me to death i had it made <gasps> So she admits that they weren't beating her. Yeah. Oh, my God. She. Every time he asked her a question that would have her take any kind of responsibility, she talked in circles. She was very good at talking in circles. I kind of feel like maybe her lawyer had coached her quite a bit for this interview. Mm. Um. She blamed the media for being called the ringleader. She said they, quote, take something and run with it. They took something someone said and blew it up. Mm -hmm. And he said, so 
you're sitting in the car. Um, your family's inside getting murdered. What's going through your head? What are you thinking? And she just said, I guess I wasn't thinking. You think? <laughs> and then he said, so my other question is, this guy killed your family. And then you had sex with him. Like, what's like you were about? well aware of what was happening. Yeah. Like, what's that about? And she said, the best way I can explain it is when you make one bad choice or I guess you tell a lie. It's not just one lie you covered up with. It's this lie and this lie. It's not just one lie. I was like, what? It doesn't make any sense. Doesn't answer the question at all. No. And then he said, so it was pretty clear you wanted your family dead. You told people that. And she said, well, I talked to several young ladies in here. And, you know, they've said, I said at one time when I was your age, you know, I wish my parents were dead. And, you know, we say things when we're young, if we're mad and you have to be careful with things you say, you know, especially to, you know, whoever. Well, yeah, ladies, they are going to kill your parents. like, yeah, And then you actually on. do. Yeah. Um, he then asked her how much personal responsibility did she take? And she said, well, I'm still working on that. And please hear me say, you know, first I looked, I do blame, I, I do the blame game, but I need to for myself and then for others to take responsibility for my actions. <laughs> my and he said, what are those actions you're taking responsibility for? And she said, just, uh, I don't know. I've still got some things I have to process and work out. Mm, just think. <laughs> he said, do you accept that your family would still be alive if you had wanted them to be alive? And she said, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ooh, wow. And he said, that in itself must be a terrible burden on you that you had the power to stop this and you never chose to take that option. And she said, yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Snap. Yeah. She was also on Dr. Phil. Um we, I hate Dr. Phil, so I didn't really watch it, but um yeah. he did kind of say to her, like, cut the bullshit, you're lying to everybody. Like, stop lying. Yeah. She didn't, obviously, but oh my god. Um, and the last thing I have is that Terry, the dad, um, he has since remarried and he has two sons. Aww. yeah and he still has a relationship with his daughter and he said <gasps> when and if she ever gets out he will be there welcoming her <gasps> because he just he just doesn't believe he thinks he believes that she was manipulated by her boyfriend into <sighs> the situation and that Scary. yeah that it was all him charlie and he was the manipulator and it's funny too because so he believes that. And then they had a person on there that they interviewed for Charlie and it was like a like a second type of mom to him. And she said that, you know, she couldn't believe that Charlie would do that. Like he she believed that he was manipulated by Aaron, which I think is a little bit more truth to it. I think they were both just really fuck fuck people, like fucked up people. And they manipulated each other and used each other for what they needed for their purposes. No. That's, you don't think that? I just think it's all around stupid. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, I think they're they're both just fucked up. Like, they're both yeah. idiots. And Well, yeah, I don't think people. it was one over the other. Right. It was just kind of like, you know, like you said before, they were swept up. Yeah, it's just so stupid. And um, <laughs> they did, they also, um, played a conversation that charles the other teen had with his dad and his dad was like you didn't kill those boys did you like you didn't take part in that and he was like no 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 and he's like good he's like i i knew you couldn't do that he's like the dad i could see because you're a hothead but i couldn't see you killing those boys but it showed that they took turns stabbing those boys so it's just all around a fucked up story with just horrible kids i i just think that they're both sociopaths and they found each other like they're both horrible people who found each other yeah well, so that is the horrible story of aaron kathy sorry about just these 
Oh, wow. Okay. I hated that story. Yeah, it was awful. I'm so sorry that I made you do that. <laughs> That's okay. Because I saw the story and then I was like, you know what? Every time I try and go the true crime route, I end up doing a really terrible story. <laughs> no, you don't. So we're not going to. No, like. Oh, I like it's really a fucked up story. I gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I didn't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it was very sad. The, I think the thing that got me the most was Terry. Just everything about Terry, you know. That to me was the saddest thing. The part that got me was when the little boy said, Why are you doing this, Charlie? Oh, yeah, that was sad too. That really got me. All right, let's lighten it up with some history. Oh, you know what? Before we do that, I wanted to shout out a couple things. One, oh, okay. We're going to go. I got to pull it back up. Hold on. Here it is. <clears throat> Okay, one, I want to shout out to uh, freaking Hobbs, New Mexico, which we have the most amount of listeners in. That's the city with our most amount of listeners. So so cool. What up, Hobbs, New Mexico? Thanks for being (laughs) so cool. Also, uh, our next one is Chicago. Fuck yeah, I fucking love Chicago. I've been to Chicago. Oh my god, I love Chicago. It's like a cleaner New York City. I love it. I love New York City for the dirty gritness of it. I love Chicago for like the the cleanliness of it. I just love it. Um, and then the next one is Chattanooga, Tennessee. Cool. And then Moses Lake, Washington, and then Columbus, Ohio. Wow. I also want to shout out that we have. Uh, 100 and or wait sorry we have listeners in australia and in ireland yeah. and then like 46 other countries but they didn't list those but i was really excited about <laughs> ireland because that's actually one of the countries that we were thinking about moving to at one point um yeah. and my mother-in-law one of my mother-in-laws is um dual citizenship here in ireland and so, cool. so it was i just was really excited about that and australia too how cool is that and all the other countries it's just yeah. awesome it is awesome but we yes. love all of you and i'm really sorry to the tennesseans when i do my fake accent <laughs> <laughs> as soon as i saw australia i was like oh no jessica oh, no. did an australian accent one time <laughs> and it was, it was bad <laughs> oh mate it was great <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> I got the crikey out in me. Oh geez. Oh <laughs> no. Okay, let's just move on. <laughs> no. No. You gotta do the R on the end. No, 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 no. Oh no. Er, no. Oh, no, this is so bad. Please just move on. Sorry, Australia. You guys sound really fucking cool, and we're just massacring it. I like. I uh, anytime I want to speak Irish, I go. I just go. Did eat potatoes? Oh no. <laughs> oh no. I am apparently part of the Irish community, so I can say that. <laughs> I love potatoes. <laughs> Dude, I do too. Potatoes are so versatile. They're so, They're so yummy. I was preg- when I was pregnant with Evie, I asked Kyle to stop at a chip stand for some fries on our road trip, like Ooh. you know, our road trip, and he refused to stop. And I was very angry at him. I said, "I crave the potatoes." <laughs> I do have to say, Canadians do it right with that man with your vinegar and ketchup on it. Mm, I love that. Yum. All right, so. Where it was that all that you needed to? Yes, that was it. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> well, that was wonderful little pick me up. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And now I'm gonna go into our lighthearted story because the last story was just yeah horrendous and traumatizing. So I'm gonna talk about the Matchstick Girls. Yay! I used All That's Interesting and TheConversation.com. Ooh. So, are we ready? Yes. So, 
a 16-year-old factory worker named Cornelia went to see a doctor in New York in 1855 because she was experiencing lower jaw pain on the right side. Cornelia claimed that during the previous two years, she had put in at least eight hours every day at a business that packed matches, but that she was now in too much pain to eat. She didn't realize that her regular exposure to the hazardous white phosphorus used to create matches had resulted in the terrible ailment known as Fossy Jaw in her face. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I wish that you could, like, screen share Fossy Jaw because it's gnarly. Is it? Gnarly. Let me look it up. Okay. Is it just, like, P-H? P-H-O-S-S-Y. Okay, here. It came right up. Fossy jaw. <gasps> oh, oh, it is gnarly. If you guys have a second, you don't mind like gory things, look it up. <laughs> it's awful. Yeah. And that is what was happening to this girl. So her doctor lanced her gums, pulled a tooth, and sent her back to the factory without any real reason. Lanced her gums. Oh. Yeah, that sounds horrifying. And then she went back to work. Oh my gosh. However, Cornelia would visit the physician at Bellevue Hospital again in a much worse state. Her mouth had developed a hole and (gasps) hussy fluid leaked from it. Oh, poor thing. Finally, the surgeon completed... Oh, sorry. Finally, the surgeon completely removed her lower jaw during (gasps) a difficult and painful procedure. Oh, my God. At the turn of the 20th century, Cornelia was just one of hundreds of young ladies who experienced Fosse Draw in order to make Strike Anywhere matches, so-called match stick girls, were employed in industrial settings to dip wooden sticks in white phosphorus for hours on end. Their jawbones, however, started to degenerate due to their near exposure to the white phosphorus. Like their jaws would actually rot, and, and it, it, I'm not laughing because it's funny. I'm you're laughing because you're uncomfortable. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> after we got that one review, I always need to like make my laughs clear. <laughs> <laughs> so their jaws would rot, and sometimes this spread to their brain. Oh no. It gets so bad. Despite the efforts of the matchstick girls to draw attention to their plight, it would take several years before the use of white phosphorus was completely prohibited. However, Cornelia's case and those of individuals who suffered for the benefit of industry inspired the fight for workers' rights, thus, their effort was not in vain. Good. Just dope. Yeah. Women's rights. Yeah, go women. (laughs) Despite being highly hazardous, the substance could be turned into a paste that, with just a little bit of friction, could ignite on any surface. Which is kind of cool. Yeah. The idea behind it is cool. The way they went about it was not cool. Right, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) These strike anywhere matches sometimes known as Lucifer Matches, gained enormous popularity, and the business of producing them flourished. Despite being aware that extended exposure to this white phosphorus could result in the necrosis of the human jaw, factory owners continued to utilize it while also hiring young women and girls to work 10 to 15 hour shifts in their facilities. Oh, wow. And that was after they already knew what was happening, they just refused. And they just didn't care. No, because they were making tons of money. Ugh. Factory workers would arrive every morning to create matches. Mixers would combine phosphorus, glue, and color, while dryers would arrange thousands of matchsticks in a frame. The rack of matches would then be dipped into the phosphorus mixture by dippers. Other workers would package up the match once they had dried 
One dipper might produce up to 10 million matches in a single day while being oh exposed gosh. to dangerous chemicals. Wow. To lessen the damage, factory owners developed new, albeit minor, procedures. <laughs> After work, workers in one factory were required to wash their hands. Oh. Dippers had their lips covered. Okay. And other factories just tried to enhance ventilation. Oh. So they're kind of like stuck a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. Yes. Yeah. They put a Band-Aid when they needed stitches. Yeah. And yeah. The girls just kept dying um, because they were still using this crap. Yeah. After treating Cornelia from earlier in our story, Dr. James Rushmore Wood of New York began to write about Fosse Jaw. He observed that pain in the jaw was the first symptom, which was then followed by abscesses along the gum line. The gums of the victims occasionally shone in the dark as well. Oh, gosh. Which is wild to me. That is crazy. Can you imagine, like, you're walking to your, ba- well, I guess back then they probably, well, you're, like, nowadays you're walking to your bathroom and, like, you see in the mirror at night, like, your gums glowing. Yeah, that's, that would terrify the shit out of yeah. me. Yeah. I'd be like, that's, that's not supposed to do that. No, that's bad. Did I swallow a glow worm? Firefly. I don't know why I said glow worm instead of firefly. Did you just ask me if I've swallowed <laughs> one? You know. <laughs> no. I don't generally eat bugs, so no. no. Like you know how you know if you're you, you were we were talking about like. Um, imagine if you saw your face like that, right? Yeah. And then I was pretending to be somebody talking to the glow face person. Oh. I'm like, yo, did you swallow a firefly? I thought you were literally asking me if I had swallowed a firefly. I was like, no. <laughs> Why would I swallow a firefly, you freak? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> so their gums would shine (laughs) in severe cases the jaw was completely destroyed by necrosis which also damaged the brain and fozzy jaw can be lethal without complete jaw removal complete jaw removal in that time oh my gosh i'm sure that was not done well no His operation on Cornelia's jaw, involving the use of a 19th century chainsaw, referred to as something resembling a cheese wire, was unsuccessful at first. But before he deemed Cornelia cured, Wood had to do a second procedure and then observe her for a month. Oh, God. Not all victims had Cornelia's good fortune, though. Less than three months after the start of her symptoms, Barbara, a 22-year-old who had spent more than three years working in a match factory, passed away. Then there was Annie, who was 13 years old, and she began seeing a glow in her hands after spending hours, oh, sorry, after spending four years in a match factory. Wow. Wow. She underwent jaw removal surgery, just like Cornelia. And after five operations to remove her jaw, 23-year-old Maggie kept working in the match factory. Mm. So just like all these different states. Yeah. Well, and I'm sure they didn't really have a choice. Like, it's not like women had a lot of opportunity back then to get a ton of jobs, you know? Exactly. And that's the problem. Like, yeah. It's, yeah, there just wouldn't have been yeah. a lot going on. Had to pay bills. Mm-hmm. According to estimates, Fosse Jaw happened in about 11% of people who were exposed to white phosphorus vapors. By 1909, the United States alone reported more than 100 cases. The factory owners still refused to do anything about this issue, though, so the workers were forced to, well, act 
Yeah. Let's start a riot. Annie Besant, a proponent of women's rights, wrote about the situation of Britain's matchstick girls in June 1888. She wrote about the horrifying conditions in these factories, including the fact that they would be fined for coming in untidy, for having messy workspaces, for setting burnt matches on the benches, arriving late, or talking. One woman was robbed 25 cents, which is $7.84 today, from her pay because she removed her hand out of a machine. If she hadn't removed her hand, her fingers would have had to have been amputated. Oh, my gosh. Or they would have been amputated by the machine. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And she was docked for that. That's insane. Yeah. And men think that we don't have a rough. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> My life is not in comparison to back then. <laughs> Just gassy. <laughs> the problem. You say you're just gassy. No, sassy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh okay the problem was that even though these were unfavorable conditions these women couldn't leave because they had nowhere else to go their living conditions are also incredibly unfavorable and oftentimes uninhabitable several countries had already prohibited the use of phosphorus in factories by the time Besant wrote this article However, the government of Britain said that prohibiting the chemical would constitute a limitation on free commerce. Hmm. But, like, why? Because they're stopping them from producing what they want for profit. (laughs) So stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Conflict erupted between Bryant and May, which was a significant match factory in London, and its employees as a result of Besant's peace. When several of the employees declined to sign a statement rebutting, rebutting? Yeah. Rebutting? Rebutting? Rebutting. Rebutting? Rebutting? When several of the employees declined to sign a statement rebutting Besant's allegations, Bryant and May fired them. Oh, my gosh. Fired them. Wow. Due to the company's actions, 1,400 manufacturing workers went on strike in 1888 to protest the working conditions at their workplace. Good for them. Yeah. Like, amazing. Uh, Amelie Pankhurst a political activist and aggressive suffragist, joined the strike. Pankhurst said it was a period of great unrest, of labor agitations, of strikes and lockouts. It was also a time when the government and the authorities appeared to be taken over by a very dumb reactionary spirit. This gained them some favorable actions, such as no more unfair fines, but the Bryant and May still continue to use white phosphorus. Of course they did. They don't care. Yeah. Even though it wasn't yet banned, the strike brought a new light to the horrific conditions of the factories, with journalists now uncovering the real threat of Fossy Jaw. The Star published an expose on Bryant and May's Fossy Jaw in 1892. According to the newspaper, Bryant and May compelled one of its employees with a fossy jaw to resign while still paying her salaries as she recovered. Good. Yeah. However, not good. After her recovery, they refused to rehire her. Oh, jeez. 
and other match manufacturers turned her down for employment because of her disease-related scarring. Employers worried that women with only half of her job would scare off other people. That's awful. They're the reason she only has half of her jaw. Yeah. The British government made the decision not to prohibit white phosphorus, which had been affecting workers for more than 50 years by this point. Oh, my God. Even after learning of the cover-up. But it wasn't until 1898 that Bryant and May received a 25-pound fine from the British government, which is roughly a few thousand dollars by today's standards. Whoa, geez. I know. (laughs) Competition may improve working conditions if government regulation doesn't. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, joined the fight against the use of white phosphorus in 1891. He established a plant that refused to improve the chemical in the belief that it would put pressure on other companies to follow suit. His factory allows consumers to boycott white phosphorus matches while simultaneously providing them with job security. The labels on the Salvation Army matches stated that they were made under healthy conditions Mm -hmm. and that they were entirely free from the phosphorus which causes matchmakers leprosy. Salvation Army matches didn't sell well despite its moral superiority, and the practice wasn't finally put to stop until French chemists developed sesquisulfide, sesquisulfide, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a safe replacement for white phosphorus. In 1901, Bryant and May finally changed and started using this substitute. In spite of the fact that decades had passed since a Vienna doctor discovered that white phosphorus produced phosphate jaw and matchstick girls, Britain only completely outlawed the substance in white year, Ashley. Last year? (laughs) 1910. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's insane. Uh, Yeah. The harm it had already done to so many workers in the name of better matches by that point was irreparable. Yeah. Even though it was formally believed that Fossey Jaw had been eradicated by modern working procedures, but in a strange turn of events, modern treatment has actually brought this condition back. The jaw may deteriorate as a the result of a class of medications known as uh, bisphosphonates. Okay. Bisphosphonates, which are frequently prescribed for the treatment of cancer and to lessen the effects of bone weakening. Oh, no. Uh, Yeah. The risk is comparatively low. And the course of treatment is less invasive. And with proper dental and oral hygiene, routine examinations, and antibiotic therapy. So, okay. Okay. Well, that's not, yeah, that's not (laughs) as bad. (laughs) However, it demonstrates how the development of novel and creative approaches to treating medical conditions, which enhance and lengthen life, can unintentionally result in the emergence of new issues. No was my story wow that was really cool yeah yeah that was really interesting thank you yeah i didn't know any of that like i only knew basically from what they said in enola holmes yeah which was like such a cheese movie but i actually really (laughs) loved it i did too it was so good it was cute yeah um, I have some jokes. Oh, yeah. Tell me all the jokes. I thought I had jokes. Give me a second. Do you ever watch that um individual on TikTok? She works at a doggy daycare. Uh, I watch <laughs> or several. They, sorry, I don't know. Um, I watch several doggy daycare ones. <laughs> I love that for you. <laughs> I don't. Oh, 
don't know. I must not have saved them. I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand. Why are you being so mean? <laughs> You're a mean, mean man. <laughs> There's our joke for you guys. <laughs> Listen to us sing to you. Musical words. Happy days. Uh, anyways, I'm mad because I I had some I had some great dad jokes. Oh, what? Love great dad jokes. I know. Oh, I think I found them. Ooh, oh, good. I found them. Okay, give me a sec. Okay. Um, I saw a magical tractor yesterday. It turned into a field. <laughs> okay, that took me a second. <laughs> wow. <right. laughs> Guys, I was up till midnight last night and I have a newborn, so you know I didn't sleep well. <laughs> so don't judge me. Okay, I got it. What do you call a fish wearing a bow tie? Uh I don't know what. So fish decated. Ooh, I like that one a lot. It's so <laughs> fish decated. <laughs> I found out I was colorblind. Yeah. News came out of the purple. Wait, what'd you say? News came out of the purple. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, out of the blue. Oh, that's funny. You didn't get your own show. (laughs) Okay, I have one more. What did the janitor say when he jumped out of the closet? Uh, I don't know what. Supplies! <laughs> I should have gotten that one. <laughs> <laughs> Those are good. I liked that. You're welcome. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyways, I'm done. <laughs> I loved it. Thank you. Uh, if you want more of us lovely ladies, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, except not this episode on YouTube, but all their episodes are on there. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're rural Canada. Um, and if you'd like to rate and review us, you can do so on Spotify for the rates and Apple Podcasts for those reviews. Yay! Thank Please. you so much. We love you so much. Yeah, oh, we really appreciate it. I have a it. shout out. Oh, okay. Out. I love shout outs. Okay, I have a shout out. So, um, sorry, Uno Momento, please. Alexandra. She is a she, her. It's on her Instagram. Mm-hmm. She is a follower of ours. Oh. And she is so sweet. Oh. And she, like, always likes our stuff and she always you know she just always likes everything and it makes me so happy and when we made our post about editing the podcast last week she Uh commented and said yay i missed you over the holiday break oh we missed you too yes and uh our friend ashley she also said that she missed us and didn't terry as well yeah oh yeah terry and our facebook group yeah yeah we she posts all the time which we love she posts some really cool stuff yeah she does and love it and yeah she posted a welcome back it was so sweet it was very sweet we really love it yeah i just uh i never get our facebook notifications so i don't know what's going on oh that's weird (laughs) i know so if we ever have anything you gotta message me okay i will (laughs) we love everybody is basically what we're getting at yes yes thank you everybody and we look forward to bringing you two new stories next week Bye. bye